Hello and welcome back to the Real Talks podcast. Breed Corkery is one of the greatest GA players of all time. With 17 senior All-Irelands, 11 in football and 6 in camogie, she has a collection that tops the hall of most counties, never mind other people. For years, her weekly routine involved camogie training on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday and football training on Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. But after giving so much to the core cause, Breach decided to focus on other areas of life in 2017 and spoke on the podcast this week about whether she intends to return to the Cork fold next season. We spoke about why the fear of losing drives her on more than the joy of winning and why people sometimes make the presumption that sports stars are automatically confident and outgoing people because that is not always the case. It was such a pleasure to sit down and get such a detailed insight into the mind of one of Ireland's most prominent sporting role models. This podcast was brought to you by the Women's Gaelic Players Association in conjunction with Pat the Baker. Their partnership through the Be Healthy Whole Meal Loaf actively supports ladies football and camogie players in every inter-county squad. The WGPA Player Development Programme provides services such as scholarships, careers advice and counselling to help members be their best in their personal and professional lives. My name is Alan O'Mara and you are listening to episode 15 of the Real Talks podcast with Breach Corkery. First of all, just to say thanks a million for taking the time out of your day. I know you're busy and have lots of things going on, so thanks for coming in. No hassle. I think the most obvious place to start is just to reflect on your own career a little bit. I suppose over the last couple of days I was I was doing my Googling and reading up and, and looking through different things. And the most obvious thing that jumps out is is the playing record that you have in terms of the 17 all Irelands for the county. That's 11 in football and 6 in camogie. Like, it's obviously an incredible record. It must be something you're really, really proud of. And I suppose even just putting those numbers to you, what sort of comes to your own mind when people fire them at you? Um, I suppose I, I've i never thought of it yet. Um, I think as I was playing, I was just enjoying it. Um, yeah, we were winning. I think I enjoyed the the nights out and stuff after more than I enjoyed the winning. Um, and I enjoyed the memories with my friends. Um, I've never thought about how much, I, how much we've won as a team or, or anything like that. It's just basically been just really enjoying myself and enjoying sport while uh, enjoying sport while I was f- at, at feeling best for it. I heard you say before on, on the medals aspect, I know everyone's motivated by different things and some people play for the memory, some people play for the achievement together, other people do play sport for, for to get medals and those type of achievements. But I heard you say that uh, you aren't fully sure where your medals were, is that true? <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, no, um, I'd say... I might have five or six of them. Right. Um, maybe just I think there's one or two up in the window still at home in about three <laughs> years. Um, look, I suppose maybe in time I I might be sorry that I didn't keep them together. Um, and maybe they are around somewhere. Um, but no, it it certainly wasn't for the medals. Um, it wasn't to be. It wasn't to become a famous person. Um, it wasn't anything to do with being in the media or anything like that. It was just pure enjoyment. Um, and while I was playing, I made sure I gave it 100% all the time. Um, and then I suppose parts of me last year probably just didn't enjoy it as much as I as I as I have had been doing. And I suppose that's that led me to you know take a bit of time out this year and consider consider my future or whatever um so no for me it was literally just making friends um and doing the best i could do while i was while i was enjoying it and i suppose you referenced to taking a break there at the moment how has that been as an experience for you has it what's been going through your mind during that period of time off and away from it um you know i i i suppose the league i, I certainly didn't miss um i remember going to the football first round of championship and saying geez it wouldn't i wouldn't mind being out there mm. but i don't think i missed the training sessions or anything like that um i think i just missed the championship feeling um the camogie won the the all ireland this year yeah um i suppose one of my best buddies rena buckley who we've been twin together <laughs> since uh we've been 14 years of age um she went on to win on her 18th all ireland middle um you know and again it just didn't it didn't it didn't really bother me um i felt myself i had made the right choice and mm. i was happy and content um and i was just delighted for the girls that they did really well um and i suppose you know we all have rivals and i suppose beating kilkenny in the Ireland final was was very sweet to them so um no i was very content in my decision um 
as I said, it wasn't for medals that I play or mm. for media or attention or anything else. It's clearly, clearly for the joy of it. Um, and this year I just wasn't ready to give the hard slog and, you know, that was it really, I suppose. Yeah, you mentioned Rena there, obviously, who's going on to win that 18. Was there any abusive text messages sent or anything like that? Um, <laughs> no, no, we, every, everyone was okay. Um, I suppose, you know, on the day, I suppose I was trying to get down to the pitch to the girls. Mm-hmm. Um, and I met so many people, they were like, oh, you've lost your record, you know. Um, and I used to be like, you know, it's... <laughs> That doesn't really, yeah. you know, I for the first couple of people I met, yeah. I laughed away. I was yeah, like, because a bit of banter for yeah, people, as yeah, well. yeah. Um, but I suppose towards the end, then I, I kind of was like, uh, I think I couldn't make my way down to the pitch, and I was like, just leave me go. And I got pulled aside anyway by this by this person, and he was like, um, oh, you've lost your record. No, Rena's gone ahead of you. And I said, look, uh, if I wanted to get out there for a medal, I'd have been playing this mm-hmm. year. So this is my choice and, and I left it at that. So uh, that's what I, I do think, um, you know, for me it was, I'm delighted for Rena. Um, she's been such an ambassador for Camogie and Ladies Football. Um, you know, I suppose I'd often consider her a, a far more sports uh, role model than I was. Um, she gives it 110%, whereas... Uh, I suppose a training I would have but uh, sometimes I'd like to enjoy myself as well <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely allowed too <laughs> no, like, and you suppose you met you, you referenced there taking that decision for yourself and, cause it, and it brings me on to the question that I was going to ask anyway it was around having such a successful and long career in both codes was it difficult at times to juggle both of those to keep the balance right and try and have some time for you and for living too during during that spell um, I suppose, honestly, I suppose it it wasn't hard to juggle the two of them. Um, but then I suppose then there is those little sacrifices where you're missing friends' mm. weddings, um, you're going home at twelve o'clock rather than three or four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, you know, so that that was the only thing that I suppose playing the two every weekend due to championship match or you the league game that you you know you knew you had to mind yourself for, um. And I suppose that was the hardest part. I I loved going to training. Uh, we train six six seven nights a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, you try and get to club as well, so you could end up playing two matches in one day. Um, but no, I really enjoyed it, and management always spoke most of the time really really well. I suppose definitely towards the end, uh, management spoke very very well. Yeah. And um, the earlier days of the duels was was hard. Sure. You know. Um. But, you know, uh, Eamon and Paddy Murray towards the end and Efi were, were very good to, okay. to chat and to mind us as well, I suppose. Yeah, that was obviously something that was really important because it's probably, if, if that relationship breaks down, it does become incredibly difficult and can add to the burden of you. So that's obviously something that you'd be very appreciative of. Not just you, but obviously there's a whole contingent of, of these, but to actually to have that support and to, be, to empower you to do both. Yeah, I, like I do feel like everyone should get a chance mm-hmm. to play both. Uh, if they're good enough to be bo- on both panels, they should definitely get the chance. And, um, you know, I suppose as a group of dual players, we were delighted that the lads really spoke spoke well to each other. They, you know, they weighed up the options, what was the best to do. Um, for the league games, if there was a clash, they'd be every second go um, of one person would go to football, one person would go to camogie and right. vice versa for the next group or for the next game. So, you know, it just made a life so much easier mm. for us and I suppose the thing for us is as players we didn't want to make the decision um, we wanted management to talk and make the decision for us because at the end of the day we didn't want to leave anybody down yeah no, so something I, if, as an outsider looking on you I was always sort of curious around that how <laughs> and look I'm sure there was complications and different and different tests of patience of different people yeah. at times but I suppose coming back on the decision to take to take that break this year and that decision for you was there a what was the main reason that you wanted to do that for yourself or you felt you needed that bit of time to if it's to recharge or take stock or, or whatever it was for you? Um, I suppose for I always said, um, when people ask you when do you think you'll retire, mm-hmm. I always said the moment I stop enjoying yeah. it. And you know, I think last year for me, uh I didn't enjoy it. I found myself getting a little bit more bitter. Mm. Um, I found myself looking after big matches, looking through the paper and see was my name on it, uh, how well did I play? Um, and you know, I just started to question myself all the time. So, you know, you have that little bit of when you start questioning yourself, that means you're not enjoying it as much. And you know, I think for me that was it. Um, maybe bitter is a very strong word, yeah. I suppose. But you know, it was just kind of those little things. I I suppose for years. Um, I never looked through papers, never looked at a match report, didn't right. look beforehand what people mm. were saying. But definitely towards the end, I was starting to do that and I felt my confidence was falling. Um, not my confidence really, but you know, I just kind of felt, 
I wasn't enjoying it. I right. shouldn't be looking for uh, my name in the paper or how well I did or were people going to give out about me mm. and I'd come away from the paper then saying, geez, I, that was a bit harsh now or, you know, whichever. So for me as well, I was just like, I don't, that's not the way mm. I went in uh, looking for headlines or looking yeah. looking to be bitter or anything like that. No, it's a really, I suppose it's an interesting perspective because I know when I spoke with Alan Kearns in the podcast, he mentioned sort of in his later years being able to enjoy it a little bit more and be more relaxed. But from what you're saying there, it sounds like you'd become actually become a bit more over analytical in some way. Um, and even you say you were asking yourself questions of yourself or what what is it that's getting at you there, and in, in in that in terms of asking questions of yourself, is it is it performance related? Is it enjoying? What is it that's sort of that's getting in at you? Yeah, I pres- I per- I suppose I was probably, uh, you know, I'm my own worst critic. I have mm. been since I've been very very small. Um, I I tend to take a a dig easier than a, a compliment. Um, but I suppose towards the end, um, the digs were to come in um, and I wasn't taking them as easy, you know. Um, the compliments were coming and I wouldn't take them either. So th- nothing was matching up for me. I suppose just, you know, was it because I was getting older, I was finding it harder to get fitter. I was finding it harder to last the whole game. Um, I suppose my biggest thing as a player was I was never a skillful player, but I definitely worked, I suppose, hard and my fitness was a big thing. And I suppose, you know, did I feel I was failing a small bit? And um, I don't know, I suppose just I as I grew older, I seemed to care that a little mm. bit more about it. Um, I was carefree uh, when I was younger, but the last couple of years I started to care more. And maybe that's because it was coming to an end. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure I was at my best coming to, at the end. Um, so maybe that was it. Yeah. I can't really pinpoint it, yeah. but... Yeah, I just kind of felt myself, you know, worrying about what people said about me and on the pitch and stuff. Whereas before, uh, I suppose I'd have I'd have been carefree that way. Yeah, actually, it reminds me a little bit of a member actually when Gary Neville was retiring. I don't know if you ever heard the, heard the story, but he was he was put out to play against West Brom, and at half time he went in straight into the toilet and he sat there and he went into the cubicle, and he just sat there thinking like I'm done. Like he was after getting roasted for a half, okay. and then he came out eventually, and he was just told that like, you're subbed off. And it was in that moment. He, I don't think he ever played again. He just went, no, that's it. Yeah. Um. Obviously, your the the questions you were asking yourself obviously isn't as extreme as that, but it obviously does become part of your psyche where you know if you set standards to a certain height, and there there might come a time where you're gonna have to accept that your own might be slightly different, or you know, or is it something that for yourself you needed to be at the very very top within you within yourself? Does that make sense? Um. Yeah. I suppose it just the enjoyment of. The enjoyment of it seemed to just go, mm. you know, um, that little bit of enjoyment. Uh, like, uh, and I still feel like that I, I did play, uh, I did have a good year in the yeah. ladies' football. Yeah, I wasn't uh, comparing it to Gary Neville yeah. out in the bathroom. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm sure I you were flying. No, I don't know. I suppose in the football, I kind of felt, you know, um, I did okay. And then in the Camogie, a small bit, I was like, with every game, I felt my confidence mm. going. Um, and I suppose when your confidence drops, it, it is hard to get it back up again. Uh, no matter who you are, uh, there is a spell where your confidence goes and, you know... I just kind of wanted to take a, a, a bit of time out to mm. see. And, you know, I suppose as well, uh, I got married as well over just uh, over a year and a half ago. Um, I suppose I'm going out with my husband. We're going out over 11 years, nearly mm-hmm. 12 years. So uh, I suppose he was always put in the back burner. Yeah. Um, even though I, he, he got to go out, I got to drive. But anyway. <laughs> um, but, you know, so I presume he was happy enough with that. But I suppose... <laughs> I, I suppose I enjoyed my time off as well at mm. the mo- uh, the couple of months I'd off. I enjoyed playing club and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, that was something I, I, I enjoyed the experience of as well is, you know, on a Sunday morning that, you know, rather than rushing from, from work uh, to a match or something like that, we actually could sit down on a Sunday and cook a dinner. That was mm. nice. Um, and, you know, I suppose... It's just time. I think maybe time had moved on for me as well at okay. that stage. No, yeah. It's really interesting because and time is, time is a huge aspect of any thing for an intercounty player so, and you mentioned like if you're playing both goals I presume there's probably one team was Tuesday Thursday Saturday and the other one's Wednesday Friday Sunday yeah, My, those, yeah. like it's like and even if you are given a night off here or there to say take time like it's but it's still a huge amount of time I suppose when 
the teams that you've been involved in were so successful over a long long period of, of time again yeah. um, around like the winter months obviously you get a short window and, and even though when the intercounty season finishes you go into the club and something rolls into the next one and then yeah. it's almost time to go again um, has it been a relief for somebody to actually have that bit of, of, a, of a longer breathing time for the want of a better phrase um, without a doubt, um, I suppose f- you train from the ladies football and come over, we used to always go back in January, so mm-hmm. you're training from January and thank God we always got, most of the time we were there till September, the first week yeah. of October. Um, so we were delighted to have that uh, nine, f- nine full months of getting there. Um, and then the winter, like, you know, you'd finish off with your club and you'd think you'd have a little bit of break, but I suppose, thankfully, I suppose we were so, we were so successful as a team. Um Every weekend you had somewhere to go, give out medals, go to mm. uh, some sort of do. So your weekend was actually, it wasn't even your own. You were actually still promoting ladies football and camogie by going to all these things. And um, I suppose as a player myself, um, I don't like to say no. Uh, I think we should be privileged to be asked of these things. And you you know, there was a couple of times I've gone to Leitrim, Sligo, um, Tyrone, different places like mm. that. Um, you know, so that that used to be my weekends then. Okay. Um. So I really enjoyed. I suppose. Um. I suppose from all the middle presentations and stuff were done from March on. Mm. So I've I've just really enjoyed like my own weekends. Yeah. And Um. I will say when Rena when Rena won her medal um this year I was like the poor crater is going to be out every single weekend <laughs> again <laughs> for another year. So, um, <laughs> that is certainly one thing. Um, I love having my own time and look I like to let loose in the winter. Yeah. Um. So, uh, <laughs> I suppose it just. You know, I love to enjoy myself as well. And so, yeah, I'm really enjoying my my time to myself. Great. Um, that's, that's the most important <laughs> thing. Because <laughs> um, I, I, I the reason I asked that question is because whether you realise or not, for a long period of time, you, I presume you just didn't have a whole pile of it. Um, and, you know, and one of the things that I, we spoke to a number of the, of the guests on the podcast around is that identity piece. And I suppose I feel there is sort of a, an important aspect in terms of separation of the person and the athlete and, you know, Every player is a person too, and all that has yeah. different passions and different things. Um, and it's a, have, have, like for, out of this year, for example, have you have you got up to anything that you've wanted to do before that you maybe couldn't have? I suppose this year I've I've really enjoyed playing my club. Yeah. Um, and is that something that would have been limited, obviously, due to the other commitments over the years? Yeah, yeah. Um, without a doubt, mm. as in you only got to train in once once a week, yeah. one, maybe twice a week. You might, as I said, you might have two games mm-hmm. in one day or something like that. Uh, I really enjoyed playing my club football and club camogie yeah. um, did you enjoy it yeah. that bit more oh or completely or get the enjoyment back yeah, as and such you know I suppose you when you play inter-county you are out of the loop of mm-hmm. your club mm-hmm. um and you know you you do have lost friendships along the way because because of inter-county because you just can't you know you just don't have the time you know and it was so nice to have like your club friends back together and you know i suppose i definitely find myself a little bit closer to the club girls again now this year um because i've just spent more time with them and and that is really really nice um uh, you know i suppose for me that was the most important thing Mm -hmm. for this year was to to enjoy club again and i really did and go back to the intercounty career for a moment like normally if i get someone on you say what about this game or what about this or what about that game but there's obviously just such a huge quantity of them um, and i'm not going to do you the service of trying to carve through different ones or anything (laughs) like that but i suppose is is there a game in particular that sticks out in your own mind or 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 games um or any any big moments like that that stick out to you um, I suppose there there'll always be a big, a big a few, as you said we were very lucky. Um, but there is a few moments I suppose the first All Ireland we ever got into, mm. uh, we bet Mayo by um, I think we bet him by a point. We were down four points. What which, year was that in? Uh, two thousand five. Right. Yeah. Um, we were down five point. We were down four points mm. with about six minutes to go. Um, and this was our first year really giving it a go and we won by a point. So I suppose that was a real standout game. Um, we all worked really, really hard together. Um, knowing, not knowing how far it would take us, how t- how far it would take us down the line. Um, that was definitely a standout moment. Um, and then I suppose, with I suppose the 2014 All-Ireland mm. football final against Dublin, that yeah. was just immense. Um, you know, I suppose... Uh, Sometimes I you still can't believe it, and when we talk about it, it was unbelievable. Um, I've ever never actually watched it back. Um, well, we did on the bus down yeah. on the Monday, but 
That was a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> and it was background entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's the only time really I've watched it back. Um, so, but I just remember coming um, after the game and even, we couldn't even really celebrate because we were in such shock. Yeah, just to, just um, to put that into context, if anyone is listening that maybe can't remember, doesn't recall, it's obviously come from 10 points down, like... Um, which I certainly can't even think of in any other final that I've ever seen. Um, and I, I watched the video of it last night and then <laughs> there's like a scene of you like standing up on the steps, obviously getting the cup and whatever, you know, or if, whatever you have to do. And it's just like, just like half happiness on your face and it's half like <laughs> shock. Like, like was yeah. it genuine shock like? Oh, it was genuine shock. Yeah. Like as in, I don't think I've ever cried after a game before. Um, and that game certainly brought a tear to my eye uh, and I think it was more shock than anything it was you know um, there's a picture a picture of Angela Walsh at the final whistle and she's just standing straight up with her two hands out kind of going oh my god <laughs> um, you know it's not yeah. your usual picture after winning you yeah. know um, so it was it was just phenomenal Um but I remember coming over to the sideline and I met my brother and sisters and my sister put out her hand to say well done and shake my hand and she actually couldn't, we couldn't join hands because she was shaking so much yeah. and I was as well. So it was just, uh, it was unbelievable. Yeah. Like, And I suppose, you know, winning team of the year as well that year was a mm. huge occasion, I suppose, for ladies football yeah. and for ourselves as a group mm. and for management and it was just fantastic. As I was sort of looking at the highlights of that yesterday, um, I came across a, a quote that you gave during an interview and it really jumped out at me. And I might just read it out, it's only a short one, but it was around that, it's not that I have a great desire to win, it's more the hatred of losing that drives me on. I don't know if you remember saying that, I just, it really jumped out at me. I remember watching a documentary a couple of years ago with Ron Nogara, I was talking about something similar. Because yeah. um, I suppose in sport, there has to be winners, there has to be losers. And I, met, I sort of referenced it with the medals later on that we're all motivated by different things. But just, even when I read that quote back out to you, is that something you still stand by or just what you're thinking around that? Is that um yeah, certainly it definitely mm. would be. Uh winning doesn't really bother me. Uh as I said before, the medals don't bother me. Mm-hmm. Um but the losing I just especially when you don't perform, you just kind of the th- just losing is horrible. It's a horrible place to be. Um and as you said, someone has to be a winner mm. or someone has to be a loser. And, you know, we've been on both sides of it. Um, I suppose more so with the Camogie. Um we haven't um you know, we've had a lot more losses in the yeah. Camogie finals. Um so we know what it's like to lose and there's all the ifs and buts um and the regrets. But when you win it's just you don't care how you played. Mm. Um, you don't care at the towards the end. You don't care who who got player the match. You don't care, um, of any of those things. It's just as a team you won and you're going to enjoy it and, uh, make the memory last. What is it about? I, I want to push you a bit on that on that losing aspect because it's something that comes up all the time in different contexts. Um, mm. and like obviously I I'm clearly motivated in a different way to you when I play and come, yeah. but I'm just I'm really really interested around that because I suppose in the teams that you played in particularly on the football aspect there was a huge I know like the book is, that I, like, I've seen is, is relentless you know and that's yeah. a word that's sort of tagged on it quite a bit I'm just keen to get into that psyche that little bit more Um, I suppose you know Eamon Ryan was our manager for t- uh, 12 years mm. Um. he was just he was outstanding and he I suppose he gave us that ethos never to give up um, in 2005, um, before the Mayo game, uh, the Mayo semi-final, uh, we listened to the song uh, Don't Give Up Till It's Over um, and it seemed to be our motto for... It stuck. It stuck with us. Yeah. Um, and I think Eamon driv, driv, uh, was a big driving force behind all that for us. Um, you know, I suppose the most important thing is Eamon trusted everyone on the pitch mm. and everyone on the pitch trusted each other. And, you know, no matter how far we were down, we said we'd always work as hard as we could. Uh, Eamon's big thing was working hard. Mm. He said um, his biggest line for us was uh, hard work beats talent if talent yeah. doesn't work hard enough. And I think we really stuck by that as well. Um, you know, I suppose, as I said earlier, the, for me, definitely not the most talented player. Mm. Um, but definitely I always felt my my aspect was to, to work hard and you know, so I think, and all the girls took that on board. Um, if we're losing, we always kind of try to motivate each other on. Um, and that was kind of, I think, basically coming from him and, and the management's ethos of don't give up and work hard. And at training, that was all we said, keep working hard, keep working hard. And yeah, I suppose it was just something we always drove on with. That type of, 
I suppose, environment or culture, whatever you want to call it. It sounds like it's something that was right up your street as an individual, but I was always struck by any time I ever spoke to any of the girls or any time I heard any interviews or read anything like that, that the thing Eamon probably, and I, I'm, I'm reading between the lines here and you can correct yeah. me if I'm right or wrong, but I always got the impression that it was very much an empowerment environment and it was just about freeing, freeing you up to do whatever you, you guys wanted to do, got to do. Um, and it sounded like it, sometimes... It, if it's in different games, things can get bogged down in systems and tactics. And look, all those things are really, really yeah. important and everything goes with it. But the, the, it seemed, there seemed to be a big focus on the core principles that you've described there. Yeah. Was there? Um, hugely, yeah. yeah. It was all about, I suppose, respecting one another and trusting one another. Um, and as I said, Eamon, Eamon and the management trusting us. Uh, you never heard Eamon shout too much um, from the sideline. He always let you... Um, he always let you, you know, make your own decisions on the pitch. Um, he'd never, he'd never, you know, eat you yeah. <laughs> for, a, <laughs> for a nicer word. He'd never, yeah. you know, eat you out of it for making a mistake. Mm. He knew mistakes would happen. His mo ma main thing was how do you recover from the mistake? Um, he'd very rarely pick someone out at half time, um, to say that they weren't going well, um, unless they really, really needed, um. But more than likely, he'd come over to you individually and say it to you, um, rather than, you know, I suppose he felt that if he said it in front of everyone, that, you know, maybe everyone might put their head down then as well, waiting for a ballocking as well, you know. Um, <laughs> so he just had a great way about him. He was great people's person, management skills. And mm. I think when he instilled the trust in us, uh, it helped us trust each other. Yeah. And in terms of like in both teams, um, and obviously success you had, I read a quote as well from like it was actually from Mary White who who wrote that book Relentless, um, and I just thought it, it, it captured something really interesting for me because I think a lot of people who seen the records and they see the wins and just think ah like they're just way better than everybody else and they're just you know they're just wiping the floor everyone, but if I just read this little paragraph, I think it was really interesting. I'd love to get yeah. your your perspective on it, but. She said the general public presume, oh, they're a great team. They're miles ahead of everybody else. and They're not miles ahead of everyone else. They're just so capable of pulling out of the bag when it's needed and they're so unified. And it's that which makes them so special. It's not the fact that they've won 11 All-Irelands. It's how they've done it as a group in tough situations. And that's the most phenomenal thing about them, really. I think that ties into what some of the stuff that you'd said before. Yeah. Um, what's your thinking or taking on that? Um, yeah, I suppose, look, if you look at the Dublin men footballers, yeah. um, they're not winning any other mm. final by more than two yeah. or three points. They're just scraping over yeah. the line. And we were the same, um, I suppose. we uh, Kerry was the biggest defeat we had in 2012 um, by six points. That was the biggest defeat we had in an Ireland final. Every, most finals have been one or two points. Um, you know, so it's just, I suppose, we were very unified and... It's I suppose for a team that's what you need. Um, you can have the best footballers in the world, but if they're they're individuals, they're, you know, they're not a part of the team. And I suppose that's what we really had was um a unified team and willing to pass it to the person in the better position and willing to work hard and, um, yeah, I don't think we were ever miles better than anyone mm. else. Um, you can see by the score lines we, you know, we never ran away with many games. Um. But just, I suppose, like that, we just really trusted each other and, yeah. No, it's, it's, it just sounds like a very, uh, it's a good culture to be a part of. It's obviously something that was very enjoyable. Yeah. I think, and I, I will move on shortly from the football and Camogie strand okay. to the conversation and move away a little bit. But I suppose going back to the beginning and having watched on this year, I suppose, has there been, is, is there a time now where you miss it? Is, is it still an nagging question of whether you're going to go back? Have you decided... Have you made peace with your decision? Where is your head with all that at the moment? Because I'm sure everyone's asking you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Look, I, I, to be honest, I don't even know. Um, uh, I, to be honest, I don't really mm. know. I, I did enjoy my time off. Did I miss it? I did a small bit, but yeah. not a, not a yeah. whole pile. So, um, you know, I suppose the thing about me is like I know I'm, I'm still young enough to go mm -hmm. again. Um. I suppose the question is, you know, do, do I want to give that commitment? And um, I suppose the whole reason I wouldn't come up, I, you know, I didn't want to make any retirement because I don't want to have my decision closed for me. And um, so at the moment, I, I'm just unsure what I want to yeah. do. But at the moment, I'm very content with with uh, playing club and enjoying that little bit more time off. Good. If another winter mulling over things. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> um, no, I was going to ask, I suppose it was, when I was looking back, or so I was looking into your own professional background and your working life a bit, and yeah. what struck me is 
you maybe weren't always going for the normal type of jobs <laughs> that sometimes people go for coming out of school. And I suppose the reason I bring that up is um, I obviously do a certain amount of work in schools through Real Talks. We do different things around resilience and leadership and that type of stuff. And the amount of leaving searches in particular like, are real flustered about the career choices, where they're going, what they're going to do. And they mm. feel as if they have to... Uh, I suppose in a way the system makes them sometimes feel as if they have to make like decide what they're after the next forty years. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I suppose as I was I was looking through your own past, I pulled out. You began working life as a stonemason, a spell in a veterinary clinic, then a dairy farmer for a number of years. And I know you're working with Bank of Ireland now in terms of their schools program. So doing quite a broad mixture. Um, do you, do you have a single passion outside of sport that you that you found yet? Is there one? Um, or is that something that you're still looking for? Um, I suppose. Look, I really, I really do enjoy farming. Mm. Um, if I suppose I got offered um the job in the Bank of Ireland, um, I suppose it was an opportunity that came by. Um, and I suppose you know, if, uh, myself and my husband we were in a partnership um with a farmer at home, um, and I suppose you know we were tied to the one wage. Then mm-hmm. I suppose and there was so there was different. I started weighing up my options and. Uh, I do miss the farming loads. Um, I try to stay away from it as much as I can. Because, How does that go for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going okay. I, I suppose I am staying away from it because I don't want to be stuck in between two stools. Mm. So I just want to give the bank a good a good go. Um, it was an opportunity and I didn't want to say two years down the line that I, yeah. you know, if um, saying why didn't I take the opportunity. Um, I'm enjoying working with Bank of Ireland. And what's that like on a day to day? What's the sort of stuff that you're doing when you went to school? and that yeah so um mostly i'm i suppose i'm working with the school bank uh, so setting up a school bank in schools yeah. around cork, county cork um so i like you're working with students i i, I do find working with uh, the ty students a bit intimidating why is um, that i i don't know i suppose look I, I, you were just saying there a while ago about um identity you know mm. um I suppose people just because you know you're on the radio or you know you be you talk interviews and different things that they automatically think you're a very confident person. Yeah. Whereas for myself, I I be quite uh, like I suppose insecure really in myself. So the TYs intimidate me a small bit, okay. you know. Um. So and different things like that. I I wouldn't be the most outspoken person. Mm. Um. So different things like that. It's just something I must try and get used to yeah. as well. And you know, it was a nice opportunity to to try it and then. I'd be with primary school as well they're doing a thing called Bizworld right. um, so this is where they come up with business do you find that more are you more comfortable in that I, setting I'm finding it a bit more comfortable yeah yeah, yeah um, definitely um, so they come up with a business idea and they pitch their business to mm. uh, the to Dragons then right. on the second day so it's really nice That's to see well, yeah and you can see children come out of themselves yeah. within the two days and stuff so um, so that's what I'm kind of doing Bank of Ireland so it's very different yeah, I just want to say. Um, yeah doing a lot of road um, I suppose you know uh, ver- very enjoyable so mm. far um, but I do miss the farming yeah um, that's, like, and obviously the farming is an option that you'll feel very comfortable going back to down the line if that's if that's the choice you, you, you want to make or do decide to make just as I was listening to you there during the last podcast that I did with Dermot Early he, he brought up quite a similar sign of, convers- of conversation and that he said that he was always quite shy and, and timid growing up um, and he said he said something he said football sort of came easy to him um, but like in all in most other areas he was quite shy and timid and you re- you reference it there so sometimes people do forget about that that just someone that you see out in the field that's not necessarily the person that they are yeah. away and is that something that because of the profile that you have say and because of you know how pe- how much people would associate you, play- you playing with Cork for, fo- for football and camogie has that been a challenge at times in terms of trying to be I suppose if it's truer to yourself, but that's the same other identity. Do you get me? Yeah. yeah. Um, has that ever been a challenge in some way? Um, I, yeah, I definitely playing into county for me. I I do find it challenging in ways in the fact that you know you're you're well known. Um, I I'd be quite a paranoid person. Um, I suppose I'd if I didn't say hello to somebody, um, I'd feel like you know. They they be turn around saying oh Bridge Carker I don't think she's great she couldn't even say hello to yeah. me you know so I suppose there is that part of it where um you know you you can never I you, when you're when you're yourself um you're you're quite different when you're off the pitch like I'm very different off the pitch you know um in the fact that I 
I, w- I would be quite quite shy, mm. uh, especially with people I don't know. In a group of people, I wouldn't say much. Um, I'm better off one on one. Okay. Um, so you know, they're just little things that you know people automatically think straight away because you're playing with Cork that you have this confidence in mm. inside yourself. Um, but uh, like Dermot said, I suppose sport came easier to me in the fact that you know I I was lucky enough to be. I suppose I was naturally fit. Mm. Um, so sport did come naturally to me and um, other things like that wouldn't be and I suppose that where it comes to the fortures how I find them a bit imi- in- yeah. intimidating yeah. and you know I suppose when I go to um, you know you go to a couple of functions up in Dublin and I sp- I'd have brought my husband with me or whatever and uh you know, I, I would find it very difficult to interact with people um, in those functions. You know, they'd be, you know, at times there was big names there. I suppose um, Roy McIlroy was there a couple of times and um, Sonia Sullivan, you know, and I suppose you're in awe of them as well. But, you know, but they, for me, they were very intimidating, mm. where, whereas I'd see other people would be well able to make a conversation. And, you know, it's just you're a different person off the pitch. Like, you're yeah. not you're not always confident. Um, and everyone's very different, you know, Um so like you know that's kind of the way the way i i just i'd be quite paranoid about myself and quite mm. i suppose insecure is kind of the word like yeah. you know but yeah it's just interesting to you just never have your own identity um i'll always be known as bridge carkery the footballer mm. um and that's that's fine too like that's like it has been my life and I, it's been a fantastic fantastic career and everything um but i suppose people forget that you know that you're you're just an ordinary person too at the end of the day i suppose that i suppose it ties back into with if not playing this year and taking that bit of a break is look we all get to different stages of our lives we want to move on or you know look at different things or take on different perspectives is is the time you have done more about that me time if you want to call it that and like obviously in the decision to go to the bank whether you did it consciously or subconsciously you're obviously challenging yourselves in diff- you're challenging yourself in a different way as well um, has that been a sort of is that a sort of theme of where you are at the moment or am I reading too much into that? <laughs> um, yeah I suppose you know I, I would like to challenge myself but I think for m- myself I'm more of a I like to challenge myself in practically you know um you know hard hard work I'd like to try mm. it and I suppose the job came up and I kind of felt it was an opportunity and don't let the opportunity go sure. to waste and I suppose I, I asked a few people and um I suppose you know I remember meeting Annie Gary at one of our friends wedding and she was like don't don't ever let an opportunity pass <laughs> you by um and I think that was that was the final bit for me. Okay. Um, I had weighed up different options and at home, and I think mm. when I met her, she was like, "Don't ever let an opportunity go by." Um, she was like, "You can always go back to farming." So, uh, yeah, I do like a challenge, mm. but uh, I I would easily, you know, I I would easily like feel that I could um, sit back sit back and feel I wouldn't be good enough straight away. Mm. Um, I'd always be second guessing myself, you know. Um, but I I do I would try as best I could and see how things go. Around that, I suppose the if it is the passion for farming, it's something that jobs you grew up you grew up in and was yeah. surrounded by. Um, what is, it, is what is it around that strand of work that you enjoy so much? Because even you, you referenced it a few times that you can always go back to it, and you sort of you half smile if you say it or whatever comes up on your face. But it obviously is something that it is that you enjoy and that you're passionate about. What is it about? Is it the freedom of it? Is it been out and about? I said from someone that's from a non farm background, I'm just just curious. Yeah, um, I suppose look, I just I enjoy working with animals. Mm. Um, I enjoy the the I suppose as you said the freedom of it. But then you're you're it's seven days a week is what you're working. Then like yeah. you know, um, and you've the early mornings which I'm not good at. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've the early mornings, but. I just really enjoy it. I like, you know, I I suppose I like doing tractor work and mm. I, I like, I suppose, physical work, basically, and outdoor work is kind of what I enjoy doing. Um, yeah, I suppose, I suppose working with cattle, I suppose, is definitely mm. something I like. And um, I think, you know, you have loads of time to yourself to think about things. And um, I suppose the, the opposite side of that then is you're, it's very localised, you know, you you don't meet many people during the day. Yeah. Um, so maybe sometimes you have too much time to think, but I I do enjoy just like, you know, I suppose just the freedom of it and working with animals and different things. Yeah, and, and taking that back sort of full circle to the to the point they made around say younger people making those decisions in school and that, um, or go when when you were in school was that something that you were articulate about and you you like you would have worded the people that that's what you wanted to do and this is what you were thinking of 
or was it something that you would have shied away from and kept it to yourself? Um, I suppose just the way farming was going, I was the second youngest of ten children, mm. so I was um, I have five older brothers, um, so it was never an option for me. Mm. Um, you know, I suppose then we went myself and my husband. We went travelling um, Australia, New Zealand, um, and we went milking cows there for a nice bit. We did um, eleven weeks in Melbourne, and then we went to New Zealand for four months. What was that we, like? Uh, mil- milking over yeah just been over there and doing it in a different environment I suppose yeah sure I suppose it was like you know I suppose I was used to milking cows but it, uh, uh, New Zealand was just like home mm. um, always raining <laughs> where we were um, <laughs> just do it was the normal chores okay. that you did yeah so it was nice to experience and when we came home then um, Dearmut who wasn't really a farmer a dairy farmer as such um said he really wants to get into it and uh, he started labouring first uh, farm labour and then he got into management and then we went into the partnership with the farmer then so I suppose you know it was something I never thought of because I thought it was never an option mm. because I was never going to get a farmer you know whereas I suppose no I suppose looking back at it if I ever if I was going back again I probably would have maybe gone to Dara after college and um or after school, I'd have gone to Dara College, the Agricultural College, mm. um, and I'd, I'd have worked my way around maybe that way if I was looking back. But, um, you know, I suppose other other paths took me, um, and I just, you know, I, I didn't I didn't follow any any guidelines. I just took my own paths, and it's it's led me to where I am now. Yeah, that's a great point that you make there. I think it's something that does it does my head in if I'm in schools and that, and that everyone feels as if there has to be a very structured, rigid path, like yeah. if it's school, college, career pension whatever it wants to be um but that's what i just thought was a really interesting point when i was looking sort of at yourself and i suppose that's something that you're quite comfortable in and even going forward it's sort of sticking with that sort of mantra of if something pops up to go in and try it um or do yeah. you feel as if you know you should have a, a chosen route by now no um i i never really think of it i mm. suppose it's just it's just like sport as yeah. long as i'm enjoying the job i'd i'd stay there um or you know i suppose if something else comes up as as Anna said, mm. don't let an opportunity yeah, go point. by. You know, I said that was I would definitely be farming still only for that. Um so you know, I, I suppose there was always reasons why I gave up. I finished the stonemasoning because uh the the boom went and mm-hmm. I suppose I was just left go. Yeah. Um then we went travelling. So when I came home then um my father had said yes to local veterinary clinic that I'd go work in there, so I, <laughs> <laughs> so I just went working there. Um, it's Thanks, not Dad. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I stayed there for four years, and then we got into the. I started uh, relief milking first while I was working in the veterinary yeah. clinic, and then we got into the partnership. So, it's just the way things have yeah. fell for me. Um, the opportunity of the the bank came along, and I said I might as. I might as well jump at it and see what it goes to see where it takes me. Um, you know, I mightn't enjoy it as much as I mm. thought. I might, fin- you know, at the moment I'm I'm getting there. I'm getting used to the new yeah. role. Um, it does take a bit of time to get into it. Of course um, it does. But like, you know, it could, I could stay here for another 10, 15 yeah. years. You just don't know. I, but as I said, uh, I just, I leave the, I leave uh, the stones after me yeah. rather than following the stones. Yeah, around that, I suppose. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, like the one, one of the big things that I've we sort of, we've touched upon in a lot of the episodes is around those lessons that you take from sport. And look, we've gone in and out of your career on the field in, in as good detail as we can over the course of an hour. But has there been, I suppose, has lessons that you've learned along the way there helped you in terms of outside of, outside of sport as well, be it in your own life with family and friends or in work? Some of those lessons that you take. Um, has has sport been a been an added benefit to you in that way? Um, yeah, I think definitely sport has. Um, you know, it definitely kept me on the straight and narrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been a good a good one to head out, um, as often as I can. And I suppose my mum and dad were all were always great influencers on me yeah. as well. Um, you know, but definitely, you know, kept kept me occupied. And when I was, I suppose. When I'm in something, I'm in a hundred percent, and mm. I try to do it as fairly as possible. So I try to to the best of my ability, um. So, definitely sport. I think it makes you a loyal person, 
um respectful to to people and i think it's you know it's great to have those and i think maybe Eamon ryan was a big part of that mm-hmm. um i suppose he for me he got us at a great age where i was 17 18 um are you going to fall off the wagon or are you going to you know continue going and i suppose he taught us a lot of life lessons mm-hmm. as well um to respect people and respect each other and um you know i they're huge things that you learn and you learn an awful lot of loyalty um and how to not leaving your teammates down by not it's simple things by not turning up to training and stuff like that or mm. you know always making sure you give it a hundred percent and um I suppose it just makes you work as a team and in every in, as, in every aspect of life you're you're always probably working with someone or working with like and you need to learn how to you know compromise how you know whether you're doing the right thing or not and I suppose as a team based thing and um, we might have a discussion how like what went wrong or what didn't wrong and what didn't go wrong um, and you need to compromise in the middle as a group of players mm-hmm. um, and I think that is I suppose a little bit of compromise and not being so stubborn definitely is, <laughs> is definitely uh, a, a great trait from GA for, for me yeah. anyway yeah no, it's just it's, it's something that comes up all the time around like look but, but the nature of sport is that it will challenge you in different ways yeah. there will be setbacks there will be good times there will be yeah. adversity I suppose and even tying it back in maybe a little bit with the around that aspect of, of being a bit shy or being a bit more timid when we're younger um, was sport something that helped you come out of your shell a little bit um, g- growing up I think you know, you've, you've referenced some of it there in terms of if it's being in meetings and even sometimes it's finding the strength to articulate what you're thinking and going actually you know what I'm going to say what I'm thinking here yeah. whereas maybe at 17, 18 we all just sit in the meeting and say keep them out shut and we'll yeah. get out of here <laughs> but did it help in some of those ways as well I'm just interested to know Um. That's a good question. I suppose, I, I yeah, I think it did. I, I suppose I, when it came to sport, I often found it a lot easier to talk about things because I was, you know, it just came more easy to me to, to speak out. I suppose Why is that, you think? I, I, it's kind of hard to put your, mm. on, I remember one time we were having, um, we had a, a car camogie meeting and I was 18 years of age and in school I'd never, like, you know, I'd have never put my hand yeah. up to, you know, I'd never put my hand up to answer a question yeah. or get involved and Hiding stuff under like that. The desk, basically, yeah, I'd be for volunteers. Yeah, in the back. But I suppose mm. we were in that meeting and I suppose there was a discussion about drink. Um and they was going put a big drinking ban on us and there was a couple of girls they were squawking back and far for forward about, you know, should it matter? And you know, I suppose I was eighteen years of eight, nineteen maybe, and I just I just said, look, I think everybody needs to be able to prepare themselves. I was like, I like to have a point battle uh, the night before a championship and I don't think it has done me any harm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just think everybody needs to be able to, you know, prepare their own way. And I was just a lot more, and like at 18, uh, 19, I suppose I was 19, um, you know, it wouldn't have been my usual thing to do. But mm-hmm. I suppose, you know, it just for sport, I just felt so comfortable in it. Um, and that I was, you know, it's just kind of hard to put my put my finger on it you know how one thing can make you so confident or how you can be so comfortable Mm -hmm. talking what you really believe in and I suppose that's what it comes to is that like I really believed that I was making the right decision in what I was saying whereas in other parts I suppose I'd I'd question myself um I suppose I knew what was what way I like to prepare (laughs) and I didn't want to have uh if I didn't prepare like everyone else prepared that I was leaving down Mm. the team you know and I suppose I really believed that that was everyone should be left prepared the, the way they want to. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually a really, really interesting point, I think, around that sort of, the respect of that individuality a little bit within team sports. I think, not just in GA, I think it's across all sports. There can be a, so at times a, a conform mentality as in these are the rules and sub, submit to this. And look there's, a, look, there's obviously a place for certain restrictions and, and yeah. cultures within that. Um, but is, is that something that you would have struggled with if to actually give up that um um no i suppose i'm not saying to give up the bottle yeah 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 but but just the actual principle of it in terms of you know not someone not trusting you to do what you need to do for you and knowing that yeah does that make more sense than me trying to tell you you can't drink a bottle yeah yeah i think (laughs) (laughs) i suppose it comes down to trust like Mm. we have to trust each other that we're doing the right thing first um you know, and I suppose I felt I was preparing properly the way I liked before a game. And, you know, 
I think every, other players should be, they should get a little bit of leeway of preparing the way they want to prepare, you know. Um, there's always the, the big uh, chicken and pasta before the match. Like, it's probably, for me, the worst meal yeah. in the world. Um, I'd prefer a dinner. Um, and sometimes, you know, if you don't eat the chicken and pasta, you don't feel you're a part of the team mm. then, so you feel like you're letting people down. So sometimes I, I think... You know, there should be that little bit of leeway and trust between the players and management to to do their own thing. Um, but going back to your point about, you know, uh, being being confident in sport, I suppose it was just something I, I really believed in, I that I, I really believed that I was confident in it mm. in sport. And then outside of that, then whatever sport did for me, it really brought me out of myself. Um, and then other than that, I would find myself, you know, out of my comfort zone even when it comes to farming yeah. I'll always second question myself um, the bank I'm just, just trying to find my feet mm. um, so you know it, it's different It's like, sport is great I suppose is it because you're working with a team and they help you bring bring the best out of yourself I don't know yeah so I, I certainly don't know the answer yeah, either I just thought yeah. it was a really interesting point um, I think t- two of the words that come up quite a bit there is around that trust and respect mm. aspect and it's probably it's two of the most important things I think anyway like for successful teams the other one that I was going to ask and obviously from being around so many successful teams like there was years where you did doubles and if it was singles God God love you if you had only had a single <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I suppose around the leadership aspect because you obviously got to see a lot of snippets or probably a whole lot of good leadership at different times and I know there was a lot of strong characters in your changing room as well but around those types of leadership lessons is there anything that sticks out with you I suppose and I think leadership is a word that's thrown, that's bandied around a lot in terms of like you can buy about 50 million books on it. But even just at a top level, what sort of leadership means to you from your perspective? Um, I think there's different types of leaders on pitches. Um, you have the girls who do the talking. Um, you have the girls who do the action. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I suppose, you know, the most important thing is like they can't be just one leader on a team. Um, it has It has to come from nearly everyone on the pitch has to be a leader and they have to guide each other um and i suppose you know you have to leaders are leaders i suppose have to listen as well you know so i suppose that's why it's so important that not everyone is the not everyone there's not just one leader that everyone is and that everyone listens to each other um you know i think for us we had huge leadership all over the pitch um and i think what was very enjoyable is that like different people popped up in every matches to take over the leadership role and that was you know we were never relying on the same people to that are the same person to take over that role and you know i think as i said that comes down to trust and that comes down to you know someone has an off day and someone else has to step up and mm. f- for a long time we did it as a as a group of players mm. for the, in the camogie football Around, I suppose, the participation in sport and playing, and I think over the last while you, you've outlined a lot of the positive things and insights into if it's attributes or, or lifestyle things. Um, one of the points that we hear quite a bit around is around the, the drop-off, I suppose, and particularly in younger females. Was there ever times that you thought about, like, you know what, this is not for me or this is not worth it? Or I, I'm focusing more more specifically on in the earlier years rather yeah. than now. Was there ever times where you, where you thought about it? Um no 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 ne- it never crossed my mind mm. no um I suppose I just really enjoyed it um you know club level I I never really won a whole pile um but under Age of Cork we were quite successful yeah. which was which was nice so I suppose I was getting a a, a taste for nice both you taste. know I was getting a taste of yeah. defeat and winning so. No, I suppose I never really... No, I suppose the other thing for me is I was never really a girl for um, going to discos. Mm. Um, getting dressed up didn't really bother me. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest thing for girls now that they feel that ladies football and camogie isn't feminine enough. Um, you know, I think sometimes they look at it and they be like, oh no, like we're going out and we're getting dressed up. And you know, I think they forget that you can do both. Do both. You know, um, they certainly do forget that mm. and sport is so good for you and it's so good for friendships Um, you know you've made friends all over all over the place Um, I suppose when Dublin won the last day I was delighted for Sinead Goldrick and Sinead yeah. Finnegan they've put in such heartache over the last couple of years and you know it was just for them it was nice to see them mm. win when Cork weren't there yeah. I felt you know of course I felt sorry for mm. Crazy and um, 
Cora and a few more and Marta Carter who've put their life and soul into Mayo Ladies football. So they're friendships that will, you know, they'll always stay. Um, I'm sure if I was stuck for a place to stay up in Mayo, <laughs> they'd, they'd uh, accommodate me nicely, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so, you know, they're the Sounds joys. Sounds like that might yeah. have been done before. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so they, if it, that's the thing about ladies yeah. football. It doesn't matter who you are, you can express yourself on the field. Um, you know, whether you're a tomboy, whether you're really girly, mm. um, you know, whether you're a farmer, whether you're a teacher, you're your own person when you're on the pitch. And, you know, I think girls need to realise that you can leave all those bits outside mm. the pitch and just enjoy training and making a bunch of friends that, you know, that know what loyalty is. Mm. And um, I suppose... You know, I have friends that uh, don't play camogie or football as well and they're like, oh my God, the crack you have on a night out is just beyond like the usual stuff. <laughs> and I, I think that's more about like, because we're such, we're so unified, we're mm. such, you know, you'd be such a team that you forget everybody's, you know, everybody's personality is the one because you've this thing in common, you've ladies football or camogie in common or no matter what sport it is, you have it in common and that's what I suppose you can express yourself. And I suppose that then we'd actually come back to my point about, you know, being able to express myself more in the team, more than outside in work and stuff like that, that I feel more comfortable within the gang that mm. have the same loyalty. They're not looking at me, at my personality or anything like that. They're mm. literally just looking at me as doing the best for the team. So, you know, that has nearly explained it for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like, and I suppose sometimes there's a presumption that, you know, so if everyone that plays in this one team, like they're all the same type of person, they all like the same different things. Like that's 100% not the way in, in ladies sports. It's not like that in male yeah. sports either. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just, I, it's something that, I don't know where it comes from. If it's, like, if it's, is it social pressures? Is it social norms? I have no idea, but it's exa- I find it the same in the main the in the men's game in terms of action. I know we probably get it a little bit easier, and but it's a big thing I think for young people. I, I, it, that conversation is coming up more more and more and more because I think the big thing to, like there there are the negatives, and we've got stuff. If you've got stuff like body images or careers, professions, whatever, yeah. whatever it may be. But I think the big thing is that like there's huge positives to stay playing. I think you touched upon them nicely. Yeah. Um and I suppose just if there was if there was anyone listening that is on defence that's maybe thinking that they're gonna stop playing, um, male or female, what would you what what would you say to them in terms of stay, sticking in there and, and hanging in? Because it's obviously something that has benefit, benefited you in a lot of different ways. Would that yeah. be fair to say? Yeah, uh, like d- most certainly has. Um you know, I suppose, as I said, you can express yourself on the pitch. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have a bad day and going out training, you you actually forget about the whole lot. Um, you know, you just have that little bit of time for yourself to, all you're concentrating on is uh, getting to the line, getting the solar right, making the right option. Um, anyone that is half thinking of giving up, I, I would say don't continue it on um, you know just just for yourself you know the nights out will always be there they think it's just training it's just matches mm. it's just your weekends gone it's your Sunday mornings gone um, you can't go out on a Saturday night because your Sunday mornings are, are taken up and, yeah. but you, you actually have fantastic nights out as a group you mightn't get to go out as often mm. um, but as a group you have fantastic nights out and just I suppose for me sport has been so I don't know. I know there's been a lot of winning and, you know, that has been great. But for me, it's all about the friendships Mm. and the girls around me, you know, you have groups there where, you know, you can chat to them about anything and it's nice to to be yourself and they they look at you as yourself, not not anything else. Yeah, that's... And look, that's something that you don't always get in different different areas of life. Um, Yeah. And even going back to what you said around watching, say, Sinead Finnegan and Sinead Goldrick after the after Dublin won the final this year, that actually, in a way, did seeing another team celebrating that moment and celebrating success, did that give you even a little bit more perspective on sort of what you what your teams have had and sort of and what you've got to enjoy as well? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, so it was I, an interesting, when you said the two girls, watching the two girls' names, I thought it was an interesting point. Yeah, I suppose, you know, they were after so much heartbreak mm. over the last couple of years, but... Definitely, I remember texting the girls on the Monday and going, God, wouldn't it be great to be coming down the bus now um, <laughs> uh, after winning? And, you know, they were like, God, it would be mighty, you know. So those memories will, will last forever. Um, 
you know, it's it was a fantastic journey we were on. Um, and without a doubt, I, I could just imagine how much fun the girls had. And, you know, I suppose following me on Twitter, they were heading around Dublin. And they seemed to have a good time. Yeah, guide, right. guiding Brendan Martin around the place, you know. Um, even the camogies, you know, I suppose they were coming, the car camogies yeah. coming down on the train. There were Snapchats being sent. And, you know, I was like, God, they were great times, you know. And, you know, they might, maybe they'll come back again. Maybe they mm. won't, but I'll definitely treasure them forever. Um and even when you lose, like it's not easy. It's no. it's probably not as much crack, but mm. certainly they're good memories. Yeah. Um, you know, you're with your your team together, and you're coming down, and you win together, and you lose mm. together would be my motto. And yeah. you know, it's fantastic friendships, fantastic journeys, and great crack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, I suppose one or two last questions before we finish up. Do, do you other one sort of on the taking the sport as, at a top level at the moment. Just as a neutral, I think there seems to be quite a a mini revolution in a way around lady sport at the moment. Like you've seen, there's a lot made about the, say, the crowd at the All Ireland Finals, both camogie and football. Um, and it, but I suppose just in other areas like the media, I felt there was more attention given there. I felt there was more analysis. And even the last couple of weeks, you know, I heard more players' stories. I heard, I suppose it wasn't just the match report and move on. Like I heard actual, I got. And I'm I'm just someone just scrolling through my Twitter feed and online. Yeah. I, I I I just felt as if. There was some there's something changing there a little bit. I just I don't know if you feel the same way, if you've noticed that, um, or if you feel it's heading in the right direction. Um, I certainly feel it, it's heading in the right direction. Um I suppose one of my biggest critics about media coverage never really bothered me. Mm. Uh like, you know, coverage wouldn't have bothered me. I suppose most of the time what bothered me was the in depth analyst yeah. of um of the match reports, mm-hmm. you know, um, it used to be very vague. It used to be very like who scored, um, different things like that. You know, it's be really, really vague in all the papers. And I suppose the women's rugby really were, uh, when they were doing the analysts at half time and after on RT and stuff like that, they really, you know, they left, you know, a couple of them really like let their, let the Ireland girls know. I suppose it was, um, what's her name? Fiona Cocklin was yeah. one of the analysts. She really like made her her point and her tactic mm. and her she had everything in front of her, her analyst and you know, she wasn't afraid to speak out about us, which you know, I thought was great to see. And I think definitely the ladies uh football this year um definitely went more in depth into the game rather than just saying uh Cora Staunton had seven scores. Yeah. You know, they brought in passages of play into it, um where things went well, where things didn't go. And I felt over the years, um, you know, that wasn't, I think match reports weren't mm. in depth. They were just basically quickly done and sent out, sent out yeah. uh, to print. Whereas this year, definitely they, there was more in depth reports. And I think the women's rugby really started that off as well, which was great to see. I suppose the last question I was going to ask you was taking everything into consideration that we've talked about there over the last hour or so. Um, if you go back in time to your 13 year old self and you could share a nugget of wisdom or a bit of advice with younger you just out of interest what would it be? Uh, this this question is funny and it's nothing to do with sport I think I'd love to have maybe applied myself better in school um, definitely didn't do that D- didn't do that to the best of my ability and I suppose you look back and you're saying I wish I wish I did Um and then I suppose the other aspects of that then are like, you know, because um, you always have the option, I suppose, really. I suppose I was going for, I was hoping to go to do a night course for um, the agricultural, uh, to get my green cert for the farming. Um, and I actually couldn't do the night course because I hadn't gone to college. So there was little things like that, you know, that I suppose give everything an opportunity, give everything a try. Um, you know, if you don't like something, you can always change it up. Um, but definitely, I suppose, try your best at, at the opportunities that are in front of you. And I suppose school for me was the one thing I didn't really, really um, apply myself in. And I, I suppose sometimes I look back saying, I wish I did. Um, but then again, in sport, I suppose, I there was times I was saying, would I do uh, different night courses, you know, and stuff like that. And I was like, but sure, I can't because ladies football and camogie, they, I'll miss loads of training. So yeah. you you did put your, I did put my mm. life on hold a small bit for ladies football and stuff. Um, but, you know, like that, I suppose school really was the big thing I'd like to have if I was going back at 13, 14 again, that I'd apply myself better. 
the bank really have your own message already, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I said, I'm going to let you off the hook now. Um, I suppose, first of all, most important, just thank you for your time and for your honesty through that conversation. Like any neutral, if, if you get back out on the pitch and see you there in the court jersey, great. If not, um, that's okay too. Yeah, I wish you the very much. best of luck with everything going forward. Enjoyed this conversation and, and we'll talk to you again soon. So thanks a million. Perfect. Thanks very much, Alan. Thanks a million for listening this week, folks. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget there are 14 previous podcasts with top-class GA heroes like Kevin McMenamin, Brendan Maher, Eamon McGee, Cora Staunton and Michael Fenley who are discussing so many different life lessons that they learned over the years. You can find them on iTunes or SoundCloud by searching for Real Talks or just head over to realtalks.e to learn more. As always, thanks for taking the time to listen to this conversation with Breach. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and hopefully you'll be back next week to listen to another fascinating guest. Once again, just want to remind you that this podcast was brought to you by the Women's Gaelic Players Association in conjunction with Pat the Baker. Their partnership through the Be Healthy Whole Meal Loaf actively supports ladies football and camogie players in every inter-county squad. The WGPA Player Development Programme provides services such as scholarships, careers advice and counselling to help their members be the best in their personal and professional lives. My name is Alan O'Mara and thank you for listening to episode 15 of the Real Talks podcast.